Good week. morning. Who's got a handmade mug? I've got a Bruce Daner today. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. It's a possum. Mm-hmm. Anyone else have a handmade mug they want to share while people are coming in? Okay. I got this at the thrift store. Nice. Handmade by somebody. Doesn't say. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Brian Ross. I'm the gallery and craft fair director at Peter Sally, and I'm so glad you could join us. And I'm going to hand it over to Kimberly. She's going to teach us and tell us all about dolls and all about her work. And I'm really excited for this because I, I don't know anything about it. So I am going to leave here with a whole new perspective that I can't wait for. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, those of you who don't know me, I'm Kimberly Camp, and I'm a painter and a doll maker and a retired museum president and CEO. So I've had a very textured life and uh, really some wonderful opportunities to do a lot of things that I, I realize that a lot of people don't get. So I feel really lucky uh, and honored. I'm going to show a little PowerPoint today about doll making because uh, when you say dolls, people, you know, immediately they think of Barbie and it's like, well, why would this be associated with art, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the materials that I use, and then we're going to go over into the gallery and see some of the work that's already finished and take some more questions. So um, we're hoping that the internet connection is going to stay stable and uh, we'll go from there. So let me get this started uh, with my screen share. I was asked one time to do a, uh, a, a lecture for um, some teenage boys on art, art and, they, and <laughs> I said, okay, I'm gonna talk about dolls. And the guy was like, what? You do know these are boys. I said, yeah, yeah, they're gonna get into it. Trust me, um, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. So uh, to start off, dolls are really as old as people themselves. They've used, been used for a multitude of purposes, teaching, play, affection, power, objects of spirit, on the sides, you see an aqua ba, that's from Ghana. And those are used for fertility. So if women in Ghana want to conceive, they'll take an aqua ba, tie it to their back and carry it like they're a baby to help them with conception. Um, this is one doll that a lot of people, you don't think of this as a doll, but actually it is. Um, this is the Venus of Villendorf. Most people have heard of her. Um, she's actually an example of portable um, art because at the time, uh, that this was uh, from, which was about 28 to 25,000 BCE, um, people were still moving around a lot. And so this piece, I remember the first time I went to see it in Austria, and it's only, <laughs> it's only four and a half inches tall. I kept seeing this thing in art history class thing, and it's huge, right? It's a pot piece of pocket art. Um, so the Venus of Willendorf is one. Um, this is one of the oldest dolls also found, and these are called paddle dolls. And they are very common uh, to find in Egypt and were used um, as offerings to uh, Egyptian deities, in this case, for the deity Hathor. And this is from the British Museum collection. Um, as I mentioned, dolls are as old as humankind. Here's another one of the paddle dolls. Uh, this one's at the Metropolitan Museum where the hair is actually made of beads that are strung onto thread. Um, and when they're shaken, they're used to appease the gods or goddesses. They're also used in performance and dance. So as you can see, there are all kinds of uses. This is one of the earliest Roman dolls that was made. This piece is terracotta. Um, and that's at the Johns Hopkins University uh, Museum. This was, uh, uh, they were given as gifts. Um, there were private possessions. There's not a lot of information that may suggest whether or not these were used for play, for children. They actually had different purpose in many ways. Um, the country that probably has the most celebrated doll tradition is Japan. And even now uh, they have Girls' Day and Boys' Day or national holidays where children will bring their dolls out on display. They'll dress like the dolls. Um, this is an early piece period from the Jomon uh, period. Um, and this is called a dogu. And this is another Japanese doll, Haniwa Warrior. Um, and this is a terracotta piece that was found in a tomb that's at the Tokyo Museum. I, I spent, uh, about five weeks in, in uh, Japan on a residency some years back and amazing traditions with dolls. Um, this is the festival of dolls, as I mentioned, the girls day. This is a typical set of the dolls. They would be from the Heian period in Japan. Um, very wealthy children will have very expensive 
sets of dolls and you can always tell the uh, stature and wealth of the individual depicted by the number of folds that they have um, around their neck of their fabric. So the more folds, the wealthier the person would be. Um, you can see them here, actually, these multiple layers. So this would give you the sense, this is an empress and the emperor because of the number of folds around the neck. Um, we all have heard about Russian nesting dolls. This is actually the first set. Um, it was made in 1890. Um, and of course, now they make uh, nesting dolls and all kinds of figures and forms and what have you. But this is where they started out uh, in Russia and the artists that did them. And then, of course, on the continent of Africa, there's incredible use of figures, figurines, dolls. This is an Enkisi. It's from the Congo. These are actually used to um, settle disputes, to cure illnesses, um, social or physical as well. They're always impaled with sharp objects, um, and they come in uh, human form, but also animal form. Bisque uh, dolls are probably the best known coming out of Europe, and these began to appear in France in the mid-19th century. Um, they are made out of uh, uh, bisque porcelain, shiny, um, and they're very, the material that's used is used because it's rather translucent. These now, this particular piece um, was offered at auction sometime back for $17,000. And then of course, we all hear about poppets. And unfortunately, I have people who come into my gallery and they think they're being friendly and they say really ignorant things like, oh, are these voodoo dolls? Well, actually the voodoo doll, the whole idea of it came from poppets, which are actually English. Um, and they were used in witchcraft out of England, not Haiti. Um, but this is a cl uh, classic image of a poppet that was used for that purpose. I always like to put those in there because people have these weird ideas about, about Haiti. Um, Barbie dolls, we've all heard of. Um, what you may not have known is that Barbie was actually a copy of a German doll by the name of Bild Lily. And you see Lily here on the left, Barbie here on the right, an absolute copy of this doll. Um, and unfortunately you find that a lot in doll making and people I think out of adoration begin to copy other artists work. It's never a good idea. Troll dolls, some of you are familiar with maybe old enough uh, to them. I still have a couple of troll dolls uh, from 1959. These are dolls that come from the uh, north of the Bering Strait, the Inuit pieces. And this is addressed with uh, uh, seal skin, has cotton, the face is carved. Sometimes the face is uh, walrus, tusk, ivory, uh, can also be bone as well. And then these are some of the earliest dolls known of African-Americans, enslaved African-Americans. And there's not a lot of these around, but when they're found, they're really quite a treasure. Um, that these are just a few of the ones that you can see. And then of course, teddy bears, uh, Steve teddy bears, they're a form of doll. Uh, Steve teddy bears out of Germany, um, if you find one that's real, they actually x-ray them and see the interior structure. The interior structures there, they start at about $2,500 now and go up uh, for original Steve Bears. Well, why dolls? Part of the reason why dolls are so important is that they really do um, address our basic need for affiliation. We know what eyes are before we actually know what eyes are. When babies look up at you. They're looking for your eyes. They're looking for that connection. Um, and so it's a basic human instinct to be attracted to that form. They can be serious. They can be funny. They can be spiritual. Um, every culture has dolls, which make them internationally relatable. And a lot of times I do them because they're just straight out fun. Um, I, this is my form of play. And so um, whenever I sit down to make dolls, it always is with this idea of you know, what, what mischief can I get into today with materials? And I keep a lot of materials around. Um, this piece is um, what's called Twilight and it was in an exhibition that traveled uh, for several years out of the National African American Museum in Ohio. I went to the Craft Museum and the Renwick was the cover piece for the catalog. Um, and so these are some of the pieces. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because there's a lot of uh, images here that you can see. Um, this, piece, this piece is called The Morning After a Good One. Um, you can see, this, I don't know, you can see the face on this, in this baby here. Um, but they all um, sort of have a story behind them, but then some of them don't. Some of them are just because I wanted to have some fun. Uh, this piece is called The Last Stages of Girlhood. Unfortunately, that one got cannibalized. That sometimes happens. <laughs> I started out making Kimkins, and that was in 1982. 
Um, I was making them at their soft sculpture dolls. I did them in three different sizes. They were male and female. By 1983, they were in Essence Magazine. They'd been in Ebony, National Geographic World. And I used to sell the stores up and down the East Coast. Um, I still have them, I still sell them. I don't do as many of them, but they were made specifically for kids to play with, but also to educate children about traditional African and African-American culture. Um, this is how they started out. And you see some of the early pieces that are here. I'm um, really started out, first ones were doing a, a muslin. It was about 89, I started doing one of a kind pieces. Um, and it really came about because my mother had fallen ill and was in the hospital. She had been on IVs forever. Uh, it was long going on three or four weeks. And one day I grabbed an old leather coat, a needle and thread and some scissors um, so that I could keep my hands busy while I watched the nurses trying to stick her every day to get these IVs in. And that's when I started doing one of a kind pieces. Um, really fell in love with the materials, the leather, how you could manipulate it. So now I use all kinds of materials. Um, this is one of the first cast pieces that I did, created um, with Manchester Craftsman Guild out in Pittsburgh. Um, this is cast stoneware, um, and the bodies are hand-sewn but in jointed leather. I did an addition of, uh, I think there were 12 of them. I think one of them uh, bit the dust. I think a finger broke off, but I was never able to find it. <laughs> um, they range in size. Uh, Sweetie is about 10 inches high. I use recycled fur. Um, I really hate that, that people are still killing animals to take their skin, but whenever someone offers me an old coat or a hat or whatever, I always take it and try to use um, that fur so that it doesn't, so at least it, it has continues to have some type of life. Um, I also use raffia, and you can see there are just about beads on everything. Um, beads are as important and as historic as dolls are, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. Um, this is mud cloth, um, typically from Mali, Senegal. Raffia, as you see here in the body, here is burlap. The face is silk clay, which I found when I was traveling in Japan and never found it again. <laughs> um, these are what I call unchi babies, or should I say what my mother called unchi babies. I will never know why or how she came up with that name, um, but uh, I still have, so I made about a hundred of those. So I still bring them out whenever I do a show. They're between four and six inches high, but I have done pieces that are six feet as well. Um, this one called Dance. You can see a lot of different international uh, influences from my travels. I've been fortunate to travel all around the world when I was working in the field. Um, and uh, so whenever I went somewhere, I always would find out what were the materials that that particular place had that were special, unique, and would bring those materials back here so that I have them on hand whenever I want to work. So whether it's suede, leather, sterling silver, semi-precious beads, but I use a lot of paper clay. Um, this is a forest bite. This is pig skin and feathers that are below here, a little sterling silver fish that's on here. And sometimes I sketch pieces out, but very seldom. Usually I just sit down and start to work. Um, this piece was a nod to Frida Kahlo. Um, I did this piece, actually a collector in Philadelphia purchased this. Um, Ibeji Idowu, which is um, part of the Yoruba tradition the Ibeji are considered the twins. The Idowu is the child after the twins that challenges the luck the twins bring to the family. My uncle Jim was my Idowu and he was as mischievous as he is supposed to be. My dad and his brother uh, were twins. Uh, this piece is Hear No Evil. Sometimes there are political influences in the work. They tend to be very subtle. The ones that aren't so subtle, I tend to not show. Um, <laughs> Just because it's better for business that way. So it's good if I make them, but I don't put them out there, but too much. But you can see there's a little figure um, in here. And this, this of course has no ears and the blue eyes here. So a lot of my works uh, can address these issues and, and challenges and tension that exists because there's so much racism in the country. So sometimes that stuff sort of percolates to the top. Um, this is my hierophant again with paper clay uh, the medicine man. These are uh, rattlesnake vertebra that are on here. I found those when I was in Texas somewhere. <laughs> this is actually uh, fabric from Egypt, from the uh, Nuba regions of Egypt that my dad brought me back. And so you can see different wools, leathers. Uh, sometimes I use painted canvas for the bodies. Uh, this is a recycled piece of seal fur. Uh, calories. These are actually upholstery strips. Uh, 
lady brought this and this is a one piece that's six feet it's called come and has green eyes this piece also no longer exists it got cannibalized i said sometimes that happens uh, after the hunt and you can see again some of the pieces that uh my rock and roll in kisi which is a nod to the congo in kisi um i did the nails as a sort of guns and roses i i I still can't appreciate rock and roll. I keep trying though, because I love music. Um, and so I did the nails for Nine Inch Nails and there's little roses for Guns and Roses and of course our rock and roll hairdo. So she's out on display right now. And my Fish One and Two, um, which have been widely published, they are actually, um, because my grandmother one time called somebody a fish face fool. So I sat down and I made one. Uh, this is my gorilla uh, on the left. I didn't get a chance to photograph him a lot. Somebody, when I was like looking to see if he was finished, somebody bought him. So he's gone. Uh, I use a lot of anthropomorphic images. So I combine uh, human form, animal form, because I can, because I want to. Um, this is a hawk skull that is actually carved from stoneware. And it was in 2016 that I started using more and more ceramic clay and i think part of that was the heft of the clay was what i needed to get through the last four years um, to be able to watch the news to be able to not grind my teeth um, and so i used a lot of stoneware that i had you know you have to punch it you have to bang it down you have to condense it in order to work it um, and so uh, you'll see some more that now using stoneware for the heads um, and then porcelain um, this one's weird i this one started out as I had it made a raven head and some raven and some bird feet. Actually, I made little pointed toe boots that were kind of turned over. And I went to put the head on the body and it would not work. And I kept trying and trying and I couldn't get it to work. And then one night I was restuffing it and I snipped through my finger tip and said, okay, that's it. So I made her tall legs and actually she sold them like two weeks. And then I looked around and said, who wants this body? And he spoke up. So, um, it really is that much planning that goes into them. It really is sort of, you know, happenstance. This piece on the left is one that's actually made from an existing doll that I then altered, I called her the Queen of Sorrows. But this is one piece that's out of uh, polymer clay and leather with recycled mink, fibers, crystals, etc. cetera. Um, this one is the second wife, uh, otherwise known as Lilith. She is hand sewn white felt. She is about four feet tall. And this one is Queen Cola, and she was done for a show out in uh, San, uh, Los Angeles some years ago. So um, what I start with is always with the heads. Um, sometimes it can just be the face. Sometimes it'll actually be the head with the neck attached. Um, I either, the head can be sewn or stuffed or sculpted. Um, and then hand forms you see here with the paper uh, armature that are below that. These are some of the heads that I made um, since 2016, as I mentioned, working with clay. I'll actually show you a few of these I think are still on my table. Um, sometimes I mentioned I sketch pieces out before I make them. Um, more often I was doing this when I was in a lot of meetings when I was working in the field, I retired eight years ago. So um, I don't do as much sketching uh, as before. Um, these are some of the pieces that you can see that are fired and glazed. I'm not a big fan of the glazing thing. And so I've been doing some different things with the texture um, of the stoneware. And I will usually make a bunch of heads first because the heads have to have their multi-step process. They either have to be fired, dried, sealed, something has to be done to them. So I'll usually sit down and make a bunch of heads and a bunch of hands, horns, feet at one time, assemble the pieces on my work table, um, and then start by sort of asking who wants to go first. Um, so this is some of it you can see working with the paper clay um, and I made these little these are just fence post tops that I glued a, a dowel to the top so I had a little stand and somebody once asked me why the dolls all looked up and I said oh it's because of my spiritual beliefs and I realized it was because I was holding the dolls on my table and they were looking up at me <laughs> so so I made these little stands so they look straight yeah it's uh you know you just sort of work with what you got right um this is a um, alligator head, a little bit of story behind that, but an author asked me to illustrate a book for her and I had to make a puppet. So I made an alligator head and it hasn't gone much further than that. 
Uh, that's the head for my deer. This is polymer clay, this particular piece. And of course the body structures, sometimes they have armatures below them because of the size. Uh, so I'll put an armature below them. Uh, once they're assembled with the fabric and the bodies they'll then go th through ornamentation on the pieces. And so that's a little bit about the dolls and the process. And I'm gonna show you, I have a few pieces here um, so some years ago I was in Brazil and I found these bull horns and they just looked really interesting. So I bought some and I was looking at them trying to figure out what to do with them. And it occurred to me that they'd make a really nice mermaid. So I made the body and I made a, a tail. And, and so the tail will go on later after, after I figure out, um, whether or not I'm gonna put more ornamentation on it, but most likely, yes. Unusually, usually I start with the head. This one, I haven't made the head yet, which is kind of strange. I'm gonna see how that one goes together. Um, this is another piece that I'm working on that's actually still wet. And so I'll wrap it with plastic to keep it a little damp while I'm working on it. Um, this is a heart stone that a friend of mine sent me from Vieques, uh, Puerto Rico. And this is actually going to go into a bowl. This is for a fundraiser for a gallery down in uh, Maryland. Uh, here's my alligator. It's still around. Um, he was for stories on Big Al, which is an alligator story that. Uh, and then these are some of the other heads that I've made. This one has bead glass beads for eyes. Uh, this one has no eyes. There's. Um, <laughs> there's a fox looking on and uh i think there was one of the oh yes this one is one of the ones that you saw on the table um that i had fired and glazed i think i this glaze doesn't bother me so much so i'll, I'll keep this one this one was kimberly yes we've got a couple questions coming in and i don't want to lose track of them so can okay. i ask you a couple of course okay so um Christine had asked um, from your PowerPoint, I think when you were showing that six foot piece, um, what, what do you mean by cannibalized? About what? When you said it was cannibalized, the oh, six yes, foot the one. Cannibalized. Well, that particular piece was made for an exhibition called Touch Beyond the Visual. And it traveled for three years. And the pieces were supposed to be able to be touched and mauled by the audience. And so when that piece came back, it was a little worse for the wear. Um, and um, I kept messing around with it and I decided that it had lived out its usefulness. So I took it apart and I used all the pieces parts for different things. So I took the eyes out and I took the raffia off and it had leather on the inside. So I took that off and I put them into different parts for other dolls. So sometimes you know, this notion that once you make something, it's supposed to last in infamy is not something I believe in. It's an interesting idea, but everything is not meant to last all the time. I love that. Um, so Helen is asking, would you consider showing your more political sculptures in an exhibition directed to issues of racism? Yes, I would. I would. That's good. So maybe you guys can connect. She. She's asking also when, when um, we can visit you in your new studio. Uh, so um, my gallery now is open. I'm open five days a week and I'm in Collingswood and I'm 11 to six, uh, Wednesday through Friday. I'm open till eight on Saturdays and 11 to five on Sunday. Some of you who are following me on Facebook know I'm building a studio in my backyard um, that um, hopefully will be finished in the next few weeks. I think we just got our electrical permit. so. I'll be able to um, do classes out there as well as um, uh, demonstrations and all kinds of things. So I'm really excited about it. Um, it's a little bit smaller than I wanted, but um, it's the light is great. And I think it's gonna be a really great opportunity. That's awesome. Um, Ruth wants to know if you take commissions. I do. Um, I don't do them often, but I do, um, will do commissions. And actually the last one was a woman who uh, said she grew up in Brazil and she wanted me to make a Brazilian doll in the style of the Orisha dolls. And that, thank goodness I had been to Brazil and knew exactly what she was talking about. And so 
um, I was able, she said that they, she had this doll and um, I think her parents had passed and her sister took the doll and <laughs> she wanted one. So I made her one. Um, and we've got a couple compliments. Sharon says, your sculptures are so wonderful. Um, Amy says, I'm in love with your dolls, your generosity of spirit and your creativity with intention. Thank you. She also is asking, which glues do you like? I have, <laughs> I have an encyclopedic collection of glue. Um, <laughs> and then I also have different hot glues. And I also use instants. Um, I my computer froze. Excuse me. I froze. I I don't know. I froze. I couldn't hear anything. Oh, can you? Uh, so I use a bunch of different glue. I have just about every kind that you can imagine, um, and different purposes for different pieces. Um, so it all depends on what they call this. This is the best stuff in the world. Um, this, this was actually made by a um, hardware store that's no longer in business, Heckinger's. Um, interesting story behind them, but they still make the glue. So I'm really excited. Um, and I think you, Anita, I think your question is answered about um, Kimberly's Gallery, which is in Collingswood, New Jersey, which is open. Um, and Arlene is asking about the price range of your wonderful dolls. And we do have a collection of them um, available through Peters Valley Gallery. And Lakota just put a link in the chat. We're also giving a 10% off um, for tuning in today for your entire order on our website. And then Kimberly also has on her Etsy page, which I think you can get through her website even more dolls so um and, and these are i don't know if you want to like talk about a price range or um yeah so. yeah sure um the, the the kimkins are you know 35 40 dollars for those the one-of-a-kind pieces started around 100 um the most expensive one i have right now is is probably about three thousand for my pangolin which took me about a month and a half to make and is almost life size um i have sold pieces for ten thousand dollars so um it really all depends and more on how much I like them <laughs> and how much it'll take to pry my fingers off of them. I just wanted to show you a little bit too about some of the beads I use. These are, as some people know, called trade beads, chevrons and Russian blues and things. Um, some of these beads are 400 years old uh, and I collect these all around, all around the world. These are red coral. Uh, some of these are from uh, East Asia. Some of these are from Nigeria. So they come from everywhere. So cool. Um, Phil also has a question. Uh, do you make jointed posable dolls? And if so, what's your preferred type of doll joint to use? I tend to not make those. You, sometimes I'll put a wire armature under them uh, so that they can be posed, but I have not gotten into the ball jointed um, thing. It's, it's not yet. So, um, and I don't know that I ever would exactly. I, I There's something about the forms that I use that feels very comfortable right now. So we'll see. Well, that's all the questions. For, so keep showing us stuff. Yeah, so um, <laughs> what, I, what I can do is uh, move, my, move myself over to where I have some dolls in the gallery and show you some finished product. Sounds and um, we can take more questions there and I can show you some of the things that are in the gallery yeah. right now. So I am going to turn this video off and mute this, and we're going to go live on the other set. We're already over there, guys. Yes. Yeah. All right. So these are some of the dolls that are finished uh, product. Here's my <laughs> fish face full, which <laughs> I don't know where my grandmother came up with that, but um, the pheasant feathers and again, paper clay and beads for the eyes. Um, this one I call my crone. She's pretty old, actually. I think she's from 2005. Um, polymer clay. She's been quite a number of museum shows and gallery exhibitions. She has skulls around her ankle. Uh, a lot of these pieces are from my immigration series that I just started uh, two years ago. Uh, created a master sent them to a master mold maker up in New York so that he could make the casting molds for me. 
And I started doing these in response to the number of countries that had been banned from coming to the US under the previous administration because it's the colors, patterns, and textures of people that come here that make this culture so rich. And so I wanted to highlight some of that. So that's why I have these pieces. Um, but then something like this, which is uh, the head of stoneware. This is recycled fur. Uh, it has leather wings. And then all of the dolls have a metal tag on them that is engraved with their name, uh, the year that it's made, um, and a number. So that it has my signature on the other side. So um, once you get a doll made by me, you know it's authentic when you can see the tag on it. Uh, unfortunately, I've had a lot of people over the years who admire my work so much that they copy what I do, um, or at least try to. Um, this is <laughs> my rabbit over here. I named him Kevin. Uh, named for one of my really, really good friends. And I have no idea why I decided to name the rabbit Kevin, but there he is. Um, his head is stoneware. Um, so like I said, I use, use a lot of different things. And then <laughs> this is one of the Kimkins and they're still around. This is one of the larger sizes. All the faces are painted. So whether you're buying a doll for a child to play with or whether you know, you're getting something for your collection. I sort of has something for everybody. We do have a question that came in um, from Rebecca. She says, beautiful work. Have you ever made a doll that you've gotten so attached to that you won't sell? And no. <laughs> what was it about the doll that you decided to keep? There's really none that I won't sell because I could, the only thing that keeps me from making more is the rate at which I sell them. I could do this every day, all day long for the rest. I, they are just too much fun because mm -hmm. the minute you start with the process, whether you grab a face or a head or something, it, it's almost like they become alive. And um, I often tease people and say, you know, they run around the gallery at night and when I'm not looking, but um, I can always make more. I've never been, even with my painting, I've never been one of those artists that is so attached to something that I have to just hang on to it because I make things. It, my joy in being an artist is in the making, not in the keeping. Um, so yeah, everything I, I have is, it's, sometimes you can tell how much I like something <laughs> by how much it costs because sometimes I'll price things so that if somebody wants it, then I won't feel bad that it left. But but, uh, it's, you know, it's that I make it so people can enjoy it. That's the point. Well, it's this idea to like, right, your, your work, you're not making it in, in five minutes. So there's something like you're saying with that whole process of making that's you spending time with it. And then by the time that you're done, like you do want to be able to look at it and reflect, right? But then you also like want to be able to share that. You want that out into the world because you've, you've had that intimacy with it and you want like other people to experience that intimacy with it. And yeah, yeah, I will, when I'm making something, um, you know, bring it in my environment and just sort of look at it to see if it's finished, um, to see sort of, you know, what I think about it. Um, the one piece that I showed at the beginning of my PowerPoint, uh, Twilight, what, how she got into that exhibition I had at the time I was working at the Smithsonian and I had made that doll. I swear she made herself because I started on a Friday night and Sunday morning when I woke up and went to my studio, I was like, you know, like, where did you come from? And I took it to work with me the next day because I just wanted to, I'd never made anything like that before. And I just wanted to look at it. And um, a lady was there meeting with somebody else and she stopped in to say hello. And she's like, oh my God, I have to have this for the show. And so it ended up, you know, in the exhibition. So um, it really, I, I wish I could tell you that there was more planning behind it. Sometimes there is, but more often not. You know, when I made my pangolin and I didn't show it in the slide presentation, but um, when I made my pangolin, I really, I did it to address 
the fact that they are being eaten to extinction. They're being poached to extinction. And they're such beautiful animals, they're mammals. Um, and so I made one to call awareness to the particular animal um, because um, we just, we just got to stop consuming things until they're gone. So um, something like that, I will actually set out specifically to make. I think I'm going to make another one uh, because I really do. I'm still so distressed. There's only about 50,000 of these animals left in the world. Um, but for the most part, when I sit down, it's all about just putting the different pieces together. And in 2019, 2019, oh my goodness, 2020, February, I did the American Craft Council show in Baltimore. Um, it was a little over a year ago. And I was really struck by the number of people that came to my booth and asked me if I made the dolls. Um, at first I thought people were like trying to be funny. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, there's this thing like where you make stuff and you send in a picture and then if they like it, they let you bring it and you got to sit here with it. And then somebody, people were asking me if I made the heads and I'm like, well, where would I get a head like that? And I finally said to one, I said, why did you ask me that? And she said, they're so complex, but you know, people are complex, animals are complex. So, you know, if you're going to make their likeness, they have to be involved in some way. Questions, keep your questions coming in. Um, and if you have any questions, maybe about any particular pieces, if you saw them on the website or something, um, feel free to ask about those. Do you wanna tell us about, about a piece? Tell us about what? Like one of the pieces, cause I think that they just have such interesting stories behind them. Sure. Um, this guy here, he is actually dressed in a shoke cloth from Nigeria. Um, and his pants are mud cloth. And the body is cast porcelain. And these are from that um, immigration series that I've done. This is a piece of sterling silver on um, the spiral for eternal life. And interestingly, uh, this piece I got um, is from the Far East, but this is also a symbol that I found in Morocco, um, just about everywhere. Um, and it's a symbol for eternal life, for the spiritual side of life. And so um, I put that on him in the front. This cloth I got from the drummer, Baba Tunde Olatunji, who was a good friend, who was my spiritual godfather. And he gave me a couple rolls of this stuff because he had it. And I said, oh, of course I can use it in some way. Um, these pieces, this fabric that's on these two dolls, this is Naima and Olatunji, named for Baba. Um, these are Ghanaian brass pieces that are here uh, with wood beads and seeds. This fabric is hand screened fabric from Ghana. It was from a woman's collective uh, where these women were working with someone to create bolts of hand screen cloth to sell at market so these women could make some money. And the one of my suppliers in Philadelphia, I remember I went in, he said, oh, I got some great stuff for you. And he brings up these bolts of fabric. And he said, I just, I saw these at the market and I thought you would love them. And he sold it to me for a dollar a yard. Um, and so I bought all of it, <laughs> of course. So I still have some, I've been using it for years. I still have some, I use it judiciously. Um, but it's amazing, amazing fabric. So um, I get silk when I'm in Asia, when I'm in China or Japan, I bought silk, I buy cottons and naturally dyed uh, textiles when I'm in, in uh, West Africa. Um, I buy beads when I'm in Italy, I, you know, whatever. When I go out to the Southwest, I look for animal hides, leather, suede, pig skin, uh, animal bones. Um, because you can get them there. I just recently found wolf teeth <laughs> in a shop in Tucson, Arizona. They had wolf teeth, so I bought some. I mean, how else would you get wolf teeth, right? Um, so I have bison teeth that I brought back from the Pacific Northwest and I use those in my dolls. So there's just a bunch of different materials and I let them tell me what they wanna be. I let them tell me what they wanna be 
dressed like or how they want to be positioned. And, you know, I just take it from there. So do you, if you're, you said, you must have a huge collection, right, of material. And do you kind of label it and keep track or do you remember it all or does it not matter? I actually do remember it all. Um, it's a Virgo thing. <laughs> not only do I remember it all, but I actually know where it is, but I keep bins of fabrics and they're, they're um, organized by different themes. Some of them are like, you know, the, the silks and more expensive thin dressy kinds of fabrics. I have a couple of bins of textiles from Africa. Some of them that I have, my textiles, I'm not gonna cut because the pieces are just far too exquisite. Um, some of the kente cloth that I have, I will, I'll just never cut it, I won't. Even for the mud cloth, which the traditional designs are becoming harder and harder to find. And so what I'll do with this, these are actually strip woven pieces that are joined together. Mary, grab me that pillow uh, cover right there, please. Yeah, that one's good. Um, these are pillow covers that I brought back from Morocco, but um, this is traditional, thank you. This is uh, mud cloth. And as you, I don't know if you can see the detail here, but these are actually strip woven and then they're joined together. And then through a process of resist dyeing is how the colors get on them. Uh, and these are the more contemporary designs. This one is a much older pattern. These are the ones that are harder to find. But what I'll do is I'll take a seam ripper and I'll, I'll uh, separate the strips. And once I separate the strips, then I'll figure out the best way to join them to make the clothing with the least cutting possible. Um, and even if I cut out just a circle, sometimes I'll hang on to it because I can use it somewhere in some way um, to be able to um put onto one of the dolls so but I, I do have a big collection it's one of the things i hope i'm going to put back in the new studio um which is you're going to have storage uh closets in the back and then the beads i have a lot a lot a lot of beads all different colors i have those sorted by color by type uh, the semi-precious ones i keep in a separate place so that um, when i'm using them i can remember um some idea of what the material cost is. It's more often than not, it's not the bigger issue. But sometimes it is, especially for like the trade beads and amber. And it used to be you could get a rope of amber for 20 bucks. And now it's worth more than its weight in gold. So, you know, I have to keep some idea of those things because they can impact the uh, sale price of the piece. So we got a couple questions that came in. Uh, Laverne says, I hope we can meet in person again when I come in the summer. How close are you to Peters Valley? Um, I guess, you know, I've never driven to Peters Valley. I can, I can answer this. <laughs> um, so, so Colleen's what I actually am from South Jersey myself. So that's right outside of Philadelphia. And Peters Valley is up in the Northwestern part of the state. There's not a great direct way to get from one to the other, but it's about, I would say two and a half hours on average, depending how you go. It could be as short as an hour and a half or as most as three hours, but hopefully you can do that all when you come out. Um, that would be awesome. And um, Anita says, I follow you on Facebook and you and I are mutually politically slash socially aware. Have you always been political and did it always show up in your work? Did he always show up? Yes and yes, which made my life as a museum president and CEO sometimes very dicey. Um, I, I don't think it was till, until I was in the desert in set Northwest when I was in Washington state that I realized how important some of my core values were about politics and, and policy. Um, and I think it was when some of the lessons that I had from high school actually resonated. Because I went to I went to a Quaker school. I went to friend school, and one of the Quaker things that people say is to speak truth to power, and I didn't realize how much I had taken that to heart over the years until I actually got into an environment 
where just about everybody who lived there was diametrically opposed to everything that I believed. And so it sometimes became a little bit, a little bit challenging, but you know, I, I, I think it's our responsibility as people to try to help people be better people. Because when you do that, it helps you become a better person. And you can't do that unless you're really having a meaningful dialogue. And what distresses me sometimes, not all the time, especially when people of, of, of who are capable of complex critical thinking will get together and they don't talk about anything that means anything. There are tons of ways to make the world better, to help people be better. Solutions can be had by people talking to each other. One person can make a difference. And so that's something that I have always believed in. I've always held dear to my heart. And I always try to talk to people about how they can do better in the world. And so on Sundays, most people know that I'm in the gallery on Sundays from 11 to five, unless I'm traveling. I live upstairs or downstairs. A lot of people come by here just to talk, especially since 2016, during the last administration, because people were looking for safe space. And a lot of people after that election, after the 2016 presidential election, felt like they didn't know who they could trust because the day after the election, they found out that their friends and relatives and coworkers had diametrically opposed views to what they thought. And so I found people coming in here because it was safe space. Um, and, and I think that's important. I think it's really important. So, you know, those, those are my core values and beliefs. And it's part of the reason why I was in the museum field for so long, because museums have such an incredible power, incredible power. People believe museums more than they believe books, more than they believe teachers. You can influence the way people think about themselves, their heritage, their culture, and their future using objects because the objects are the evidence of our civilization. So yeah, <laughs> I've always been like that. And um, people in the museum, they, people knew that I would tell you what I thought about something. If they really ask me, I will tell you. On that note, we have a similar collection about how, or question about how you've always been. Were you always a collector of these kinds of objects your whole life? Um, yes, but I collect very judiciously and because um, it's very easy for artists to become hoarders. <laughs> and I'm not doing that. I think because, because I was also working in the museum field and directors usually last about four or five years before you move on to the next thing. So about every four or five years, I had to, I would move. And so unlike a lot of people who have been stationary in one place, about every four or five years, I had to purge and concentrate. And I'd have a yard sale and I would pack the things that meant the most to me. And I know that that has been a blessing when I talk to people who have been in the same house for 20, 30, 40 years and have to downsize and are faced with that. Um, moving here was the most drastic downsizing I've done because um, my apartment here is about 1600 square feet, the smallest space I've lived in since I was in college. Um, and um, I really had to decide what was important. So I have a collection of dolls from around the world that I have in my apartment upstairs. Um, and they're all handmade pieces that people would make for a child or something would make. They're not the commercially manufactured things. I have a library. My library is important to me. It's full of books about dolls, doll making, but it's also books about poison plants and, and tarot cards and, and novels. And I love my library. I have a room that is specifically my library. I will ever have not have that. Um, but it's my mother that got me collecting antiques. And so some of the pieces that I got when I was a child, I still had, unfortunately, I had a, uh, I don't know, some of you might remember, there was a speedy Alka-Seltzer. Um, they made banks and it was a little speedy Alka-Seltzer, it was plastic and a slot in the top of his head and you could get him in box tops. 
and I had them on display in the gallery and actually somebody went into the case and stole them. Uh, so I took all the other stuff upstairs. <laughs> I took all my other collection stuff upstairs. Um, and then other things, when I moved here and had to downsize, I put them in the gallery, I sold them. Um, Sharon's asking, I, I think we, she says if it's not appropriate for this talk, but I think so. Um, can you talk about your paintings a bit? They are so wonderful and personal. Oh, thank you. Um, I've been painting actually for 53 years. <laughs> and um, I, I paint a lot of family members. Uh, I paint realistically, um, I love color. Um, I will oftentimes when I'm painting family or, or friends, you'll see an echo of spirit in the pieces. Um, sometimes I will make up people um, and images. And so I also do work because one of my other interests is the metaphysical and the occult. And so some of those pieces have spiritual themes that will cross into spiritual traditions from West Africa, from Brazil, from, from Cuba, from Sweden. Um, from Israel. Um, I've studied a lot of uh, mystic traditions from all over the world. And so I use those symbols uh, in my paintings. And some of those are just straight out fun as well. But um, a lot of them I do just to really celebrate. Um, people are all the same. And my goal of my paintings is to show that we really are all the same. Um, we, we love our children the same way. We respect elders the same way. We honor our parents the same way. So if people look at the paintings and they can see beyond the color of the skin of somebody's in there and they can look at, you know, the best compliment I get is somebody who's not African-American looking at a painting and saying, you know what, that reminds me of my son when they were playing in the yard last year, I'm buying that painting. Or that reminds me of this woman I met when I was traveling in France and, you know, I have to have it. That's what I try to get to in my painting. I love that. Um, Anshu, I think you might have come in late, um, is asking if you make the dolls yourself and the porcelain cast dolls. Um, so she makes everything. And if you, but I, I do want to just say this, um, this is streaming live on Facebook. So if you did come in late and want to catch up immediately, you can just head over to our Facebook page after this and the video will populate there. And then we're also going to put it on YouTube and send an email out to you in the next day or two. But, oh, yeah. um, if you want to expand any on that. And then um, Jeanette um, says, hi, Kimberly, you know, I love your work. I will be in the gallery to have my 30 year Kim Kim redressed. Can you give us a little info on your paintings as well, which you just didn't thank you for the presentation. Um, Anshu is asking, are most of your designs influenced by your hometown? No. Um, I. I've, I really, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world. There are a few places I haven't been yet that I want to go, but um, I, it's so exciting when you get a chance to experience a new place, a new culture, um, the people that you meet there, the relationships that you make. And so, you know, all of that really influences my work. And some people I've had to try to put me in a box and say, oh, you know, you're an African-American artist. Mm, I'm African-American <laughs> and I'm an artist. But, you know, there's a lot goes into that. Huh? It's not just one level or one, one layer of a reality. There are multiple layers to those realities. And so the influences come from everywhere. I have customers who walk in here who inspire me that I'll paint or I'll make a doll look like them because I just find them interesting. Um, and I've done that just about my entire artistic career. One of the newer paintings I have in here is gonna be in a show at Perkins, I think in a couple of weeks, um, is one of my customers. She was walking around the gallery. She was just so amazingly beautiful. And I said, I know you're gonna think I'm weird, but I'm an artist, just back up to where you were, stand like you were a few minutes ago, I'm gonna take your picture. You know, it, it's life is life is exciting. There's lots of fun things that happen just about every day. Um, Anita says she's going to visit you on her way to her hometown, Philadelphia. Great. And Christina is an artist hoarder here too. <laughs> um, Anshu had asks, have you or will you make a doll resembling yourself? No. 
not ever. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, there is a power that I believe um, dolls have. And so I would never, and it's probably because of my studies in, in the metaphysics and the occult, that when you go to that kind of level of realism, it's not possible to make a piece like that that doesn't have its own energy. And so I would never, if I made a doll that looked like me, I would never let anybody see it. I would have to lock it up somewhere so nobody ever got it. There is power in objects. There is power that is transferred from the maker's hands to the objects. It's part of why we have an affection for things that are made by hand that touch us in a different way than things that are made by a machine. Not everybody would believe that. I believe that's my truth, that I think that there's a particular energy there. And part, what's the proof of that? Just recently I saw an article, I think it was in National Geographic where there was a, I don't know, some shell that was like 10,000 years old. And science was able to actually recreate the sound that the ocean made at the time the shell was formed because of the imprint of the environment inside of the shell that could then be played back. So, you know, that, that's sort of drilling down into the micro level of why something like that is possible, but there is science that suggests that that's likely. That's fascinating. <laughs> um, Christine, I'm not sure what, she put a link in the chat, info on Speedy. I'm not sure what that is, but maybe somebody knows. Um, Beth says, I've never been a doll person, but tuned in because I love hearing other artists talk about their work and inspirations. And I've absolutely loved hearing you speak and do love your work. So thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And it I, is after the, the hour, but if, um, oh, here, she collected a speedy that was stolen. Oh, okay. She was putting an info to that. Um, but it is after the hour, but if you do have a couple more questions, um, we'd love to have Kimberly answer them. So please, now's your chance to put them in the chat. Um, and do you have anything else that you want to share with us? Other than, uh, you know, the galleries in Collingswood, it's on Haddon Avenue, which is the main drag, 709 Haddon Avenue. And you can go to my Facebook page or my website. Uh, the gallery is Gallery Marie. It's spelled, it's spelled the French way. So it's G-A-L-E-R-I-E, -E, uh, Marie. I named it for my mother. And um, I'm here and people are welcome to stop by. I have a lot of the work in the gallery. I'm also gonna be doing the Peters Valley uh, craft show, the virtual craft show. This will be my second time doing the show. I'm really excited about that. And uh, the American Craft Council for their craft week uh, in Baltimore, I'm gonna be doing that. That's also virtual. So um, there's lots of different places to see my work and the best place is to come here and see it in person. So I can't thank you enough for this opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, good. We did get another question. Um, Antu's asking, have you explored the traditional art forms in India and the puppets they make, which are based on old folk tales? I, you know, I, you, some years ago, there was an artist on there, Jeff Donaldson, who was such a good friend. And he was um, one of the original members of Afro Cobra. And I remember Jeff looking at my work and saying that he expected me to make puppets next and have them start moving around. And I haven't done that yet. And I say yet because um, sometimes I can feel when there's a creative spurt about to happen. And I'm sort of in that mood right now, which is why I started that mermaid with the bullhorn, which I've had for years, but uh, for some reason I just felt compelled to Start it now, even though I have five jillion other things that I'm supposed to be doing, including writing a book. So I do have some puppets in my collection and I had some in the gallery, but they're all, they're all gone except for one that I'm not sure I'm gonna sell. But it's a, it's a fascinating forum. And uh, I think I'm gonna ex be exploring it some more in the future. 
Well, Anshu is happy to connect you with artists and literature if you do want to pursue that. So maybe you guys can connect. Um, cool. That would be great. <laughs> Um, and so tell us just a little bit more about your gallery and what, what you have in there. So Gallery Marie has about 200 artists from around the world. My goal is to show people that you can buy original things from artists. You don't have to buy pre-made stuff in department stores. And most of the people that come here are entry-level collectors. So it's a very non-traditional gallery. I don't do shows. I don't do the wine and cheese thing. Um, <laughs> you come in, if there's a painting on the wall you like, you buy it, I take it down, I put something else up. Um, there are things in here for $5, there's things in here for 5000 And I have, aside from paintings and dolls and sculpture, I have uh, scarves and jewelry, I have a felt horse from Tibet, I have African sculpture, I have masks made by traditional artists, I have all kinds of doodads and knickknacks and fun things that I find that I just think are fascinating. And so I put them in here. And um, I said, most of my, most of my folks are uh, first time collectors. So they come in and maybe they're buying their first original painting or first doll. And I'm able to talk to people about the work and about collecting. Um, a lot of that comes from my working in the museum field for 25 years. So uh, sometimes we have rather detailed conversations about why people should uh, consider it and how to look at art, which is so important. Um, how to look at art, how to talk about it. Um, and so I do a lot of that stuff in here. And uh, when we're post pandemic, at some point this will be over. Um, I have a few events a year. I always have an anniversary party, second week of July. Uh, the art festival in Collingswood is the third week of August. That's for two days. And we usually do a story slam during the, during the festival. I usually do cake and champagne for my birthday in September. Although this year I'm thinking about giving myself a surprise party. So don't tell her when you get the invitation. <laughs> um, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, people come in and they, they say the place is fun. Uh, and it has a really good energy about it. So some of that is because of the wonderful people in this community. I saw Sharon uh, Ritz had signed on earlier and she's one of my customer friends. I have a lot of those folks. Um, and so I, I welcome everybody to come on down. Well, Sharon did just put in the chat, Gallery Marie is an amazing place to visit and shop. There are so many unique items and art, all inspirational. Um, and Arlene asked if you have any Makande art in the gallery. I don't. I don't, not at the moment, but we'll see. And Anju asks, how do you differentiate between art and craft? There is a thin line of differential. I don't think there's a line at all. How could there be a line? What are you gonna say? I make art with this hand and craft with this hand? You know, I think there's, there's an artificiality that we perpetuate in the arts that suggests that a certain forms are higher than other forms. And that artificiality is based in a framework of white supremacy. How do I get there from here? Albert Barnes, and I, some of you know that I ran the Barnes for seven years, and I, I was the first professional director in the history of the Barnes. Barnes thought that the line between craft and fine art was absolutely artificial, as did John Dewey. And so what he would do in the galleries, he would show a Pennsylvania German blanket chest below a Matisse or a Cezanne. It would have the same brushwork. It would have the same color usage. It would have the same surface treatment, the line. But you know the name of one artist and you don't know the name of the other one. There are some traditional crafts that are so complex that involve understanding chemistry, biology, physics in terms of light, all, all of these different combinations of skills that might go into just creating a piece of fabric. And you can't tell me that one piece is high fine art and the other one isn't. So I don't, I've never bought into that. I don't, I don't believe it. I don't support it. Um, 
and and this notion somehow that if it's a painting done by a dead French guy, that means it's supposed to cost millions of dollars. I, uh, uh, I don't believe it. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well said. I love it. <laughs> um, that's awesome. But so, if there are no other questions, he loves that. Um, then I think maybe it's time to sign off a little. I don't want to because I have loved this so much. Um, it's been so wonderful to hear from you. And thank you, thank you all your for your work and everything. It's just what a what a really special hour we've had. So thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Um, and go visit Kimberly and check out. She's gonna, like she said, be one of our um, virtual craft market exhibitors. And that is gonna be May 1st and 2nd. So we're be gonna be launching registration this week. Keep an eye out in your email for that. And you can visit with her um, live in, in her virtual booth. So you, you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation um, coming up. And, um, and then next week is our last one of the series. Um, we are going to have Tara Locklear, who makes really cool um, jewelry out of reclaimed or recycled skateboards and silver. And I have a pair of her earrings that I will be wearing next week um, and probably buy another pair after that. So um, that's going to be a really great conversation as well. And so everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. And I will send out an email with the link to this so you can watch it all over again um, or share it. Um, so tell all your friends about it and take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.